So today we're in for a treat as the collaboration between the Cape Cod Museum of Art, the printmakers of Cape Cod, and the Dennis Conservation Land Trust continues. I'm Benton Jones, I'm the director of art here at the Cape Cod Museum of Art. Uh, it was almost two years ago I sat down with Julie Early, who's here with us tonight, executive director of the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. And we both agreed, actually, the speakers are allowed to take off their masks. <laughs> we both agreed that an exhibition collaboration would be a great way to reinforce the great work that the Dennis Conservation Land Trust does while providing a rich basis for a visual art exhibition. And serendipitously, the printmakers of Cape Cod submitted a proposal for an exhibition that would focus on environmental awareness as a means of celebrating their 45th anniversary. It was this genesis of the, uh, it was of this genesis that the exhibition, Printmakers of Cape Cod, Inspirations from the Dennis Conservation Land Trust took form. The museum, along with the Dennis Conservation Land Trust, invited all members of the Printmakers of Cape Cod to create artwork inspired by one or more of the Dennis Conservation Land Trust's many land holdings, including Garden Chase, uh, Chase Garden Creek, Coles Pond Bog, Old Fort Field, Swan River, Sisuit Neck, and Bass River Park. The juror was Sarah Hall, uh, and she selected 34 prints. Some are representative and some are abstract, uh, and they're created by using a wide variety of printmaking techniques to be included in this exhibition that celebrates the stewardship of land and trails by the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. I would like to uh, thank Sarah Ringler and Elizabeth Perry, the co-presidents of the Printmakers of Cape Cod, and all the participating artists in the exhibition who applied their vision to these landscapes and have offered their support to both the museum and the trust. Uh, today, we're excited to have a joint presentation, first half with Joe Massey, Dennis Conservation Land Trust President, followed by Leslie Kramer, one of the printmaking participants in the exhibition. So uh, please join me in welcoming David Frixel, Land Manager of the Dennis Conservation Land Trust, who will introduce Joe Massey. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for um, coming to this event. I played a very minor role in getting this together, um, but I wanted to just reiterate the thanks that um, Benton um, put forth um, to Benton and everybody else at the Cape Cod Museum of Art, um, as well as the printmakers. Your artwork is amazing. Um, and Joe, our president, implied he might buy um, one or two pieces for our <laughs> office, so we're very much excited about that. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Joe, our board president today, um, to give you an overview of the story of Dennis Conservation Land Trust. David's still a little new, so I was kind of concerned about what he would actually say. <laughs> he seems to have more freedom than people who have been around more. <laughs> You're a pretty good guy. We'll see how it works. <laughs> My name is Joe Massey, and I do have the privilege of being the president of the board of the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. Thank you to Kathleen and Benton and Joyce and Sarah Hall, Leslie, and the printmakers of Cape Cod for the idea, creating artwork inspired by the DCLT's open space holdings and for the spectacular result in the exhibition, Inspirations from the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. When Kathleen Benton suggested the idea that artists creating on trust properties could generate interest in what both the museum and trust are about, we thought it was a great idea. However, at least not I ever expect, expected your creative process would generate both interesting interpretations of the land in such incredible beauty. Of course, I should have known. The community of artists finds beauty everywhere, and through the creative process, you build and then share your vision with an audience who never is as surprised as I was with the result. This art, your representation, generates new perspectives, changes our thoughts, our paradigm about the land that will result in dividends in so many ways. 
And I guess to some degree that is what art does. Art creates a conversation. What seems so set in stone from our own perspective, your art, like a stone in a pond, creates ripples that send us in new and exciting directions. You make us think. And generally speaking, thinking is a good thing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your genius with all of us who can and those of us who cannot create visual art. In the early 2000s, both my wife and I worked hands-on uh, hands to support the Cape Museum of Art. Roger and I worked with Linda Kent to further the work of the Education Department and, in essence, supplied the means to computerize the art education process. I was fortunate to work with Doug and Nancy Jamison and many others to deliver Art in the Garden, sponsored by the CCMA. Well, far from being artists ourselves, both Rosemary and I appreciate and support the goals of the Gate Museum of Art. Now, if I may, let me move to firmer ground, land preservation, and the role of the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. We the Trust came to life in 1988, at a time when the Cape was in the process of being overrun by development. A small group of concerned citizens, volunteers without support, took on the job of trying to save as much open space as possible. They met in kitchens, living rooms, and dining rooms. There was no office, there was little money, but there was grit and a powerful message regarding the rural character of our town and the importance of open space. No vision was written when this small group formed the trust. However, when we finally put a vision on paper, it probably isn't at all different than what the original founders envisioned. Our vision is simply to be the best at promoting sound conservation practices that create a town, abundant and open space, natural resources, and the will to protect them. And I'll tell you why as we go on. Just how are we doing on the road to con continually achieving that vision? President Biden set a goal of protecting 30% of the country's natural resources by 2030. The Cape has, in total, already exceeded that goal. Although Dennis may not be at the top of the open space preservation scoreboard, we have preserved 656 acres of land as a truss, more than one square mile in a town that is barely over 20 square miles big, including open space protected by the town, the trust, and the water department. Dennis is approaching Biden's goal of 30% open space protection within our town. Landowners, the trust, the town, and the state are all partners in achieving our land preservation goals. We are the Dennis Conservation Land Trust. 17 trustees, a handful of part-time advisors and consultants, lots and lots of volunteers, and a staff of two and a half. Julie early, early, our executive director with decades of experience in the environmental field. David Frixell, our land manager, brings with him a PhD in ecology and evolutionary bio biology and a love of the outdoors, and Janice Bacchus, our administrative assistant. All of us work to acquire and preserve and protect open space within the town of Dennis to achieve our vision. I can't say enough about our trustees, our staff, our advisors and our volunteers. Each and every one is focused. Each and every one works for the common good. And each and every one contributes their gifts to ensure our success. And by the way, we have fun doing it. I'd like to share just a little bit about our mission, which is the Trust strives to acquire and protect open space in Dennis. We promote sound conservation practices through environmental education and outreach while working with others who share common interests and values in preserving land and a quality of life. We wish to state categorically as a trust that all land, marsh, and water are important to us and should be to everyone on this single source aquifer island bounded by the border by the sound, the ocean, and the bay. Forests and open space not only provide habitat for a myriad of animals and space for us to walk and appreciate the natural world. Our forests and marshes are critical to our health and well-being. We at the Trust don't discriminate, discriminate about what open space we preserve. Be it water, marsh, or land, 
it is all open space. All are important to the preservation of a healthy environment. All are critical to wild and human life, and in some rare cases, wild human life. <laughs> I get a couple of that. Our forests and marshes act as carbon sinks. They store carbon. As we move either forest or marsh, we reduce the environment's ability to remove carbon from the atmosphere. The Lincoln Institute of Land Policy states, open space, space possesses natural system value as it provides direct benefits to human society through processes such as ground storage, climate moderation, flood control, storm damage prevention, and air and water pollution abatement. In other words, we need open space. We need as much as we can secure, and once we have it, we need to protect it. Once we own it, we need to take care of it, and we do that through stewardship. Taking care of what we either own or preserve in some other way is an extremely important part of what our trust does. We have both a legal and ethical mandate to care for the land which has been entrusted to us. Stewardship of the land is carried out by Dave as land manager, a dedicated trustee, Bob Lawford, and a host of volunteers. They ensure that what we have inherited remains as pristine as possible. Dave, Bob, and our land stewards, all volunteers, the stewardship team, ensure no illegal activities occur on the land for which we are responsible, like dumping, illegal storage, illegal pruning or tree removal. The stewards also maintain trails removing falling branches and trees and pruning to ensure safe passage. The stewards remove invasive species. That's a couple of people from New York and three from New Jersey. And, <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> and finally, they install and maintain signage and fencing and ensure the integrity of our, bond, our properties through the installation and care of boundary markers. You can imagine there is nothing more pleasant than knocking on the abutter's door and having discussion regarding the integrity of our property when it is indeed open space and a perfect place to put that which you don't really care to have on your property on our property. That's Dave's job. And he does a great job doing it. In our mission statement, we also refer to education and outreach. The trust team seeks to accomplish this aspect of our mission through both formal and informal means. On several of our properties, we have depictions of the history and or ecology of the land. We also have QR codes on, on signage at other properties, which when accessed by your iPhone, present a short video which tells the story of that particular land. The same videos are available on our website. The following video was prepared for Old Ford Field. In 2011, the Dennis Conservation Trust and the town of Dennis purchased the old Fort Field property, which is 8.2 acres of pine woodland, some red cedar forest, and brackish marsh. Environmentally, it is of critical importance. There is beautiful, healthy salt marsh and lots of it. And the importance of salt marsh cannot be overstated. It's what keeps our waterways clean. When the fresh water carrying whatever pollutants it may be carrying runs up against the salt marsh, it is fixed within the soil of the salt marsh and actually used as nutrients so that the marsh grass can grow. The purchase of Old Fort Field contributed to a, a larger effort of protecting wildlife corridor along Chase Garden Creek. Chase Garden Creek is one of the largest salt marsh systems in Dennis, and it provides a nursery for commercially important finfish and shellfish. The red maple swamp provides a wooded buffer for mammals that are feeding at the edge of Chase Garden Creek, including the rare minks and fishers that uh, have been documented along Cape Cod Bay, in addition to the, the deer that like to go out on the edge of the marsh. At any given time, you could see gray blue heron. You could also see a lot of woodland birds like woodpeckers and cardinals. The wetland at Old Fort Field was probably originally a white cedar swamp. As the colonists took over, they cleared the swamps, 
first for their wood and later for the cranberries, the Old Fort Field was planted out to be three house lots on marginal land budding very sensitive wetland property. The Dennis Conservation Trust was determined not to let that development proceed and was able to cobble together a little bit of town, a little bit of state money to supplement the private funds that were raised. The entire property was purchased for $425,000. That was a collaborative effort with the Conservation Trust and the land grant. The town served as a vehicle for acquiring the land. The evolution of Cape Cod's landscape from wooded to cleared to commercial cultivation and now back to its natural state as a wooded swamp is really the story of Cape Cod's landscape here in a microcosm at Old Fort Field. We also, in addition and regarding education, we sponsor guided walks to explore the ecology of the land. These guided walks may be a trip to the aquaculture grants of Budding Cross Pasture and with a briny oyster sample from John Lowell, an aqua farmer in Dennis. Children may participate in a walk along our trails in what is referred to as a story walk, where a children's book is depicted along the trail. Or those who like to, or would like to, actually consume the bounty of provided in nature may accompany an expert who will point out what is edible and what is not. You don't want me to lead that particular tradition. <laughs> I can't tell what I'm sure going All of our walks and talks are geared toward a partnership with the natural environment. They are informative and they are enjoyable. So take a walk with us and explore the wild side of Dennis. Visit our website to see the what, when, and where regarding our educational walks. In the mission statement, we speak to working with others who share common interests and values in preserving the land and our quality of life. To that end, one of the partnerships we are most proud of is the one established five years ago with the Native Land Conservancy in Mashpee. In 2016, we became the first land trust east of the Mississippi to create a cult formal cultural respect agreement with a Native Land Trust. In essence, this agreement formally welcomes the indigenous people of our community, primar primarily Wampanoag, back to the lands we now own, but their forebearers held in common for thousands of years. We would like to share this video presented, created by the Dennis Conservation Land Trust with the Native Land Conservancy, which honors this first of its kind contract. In Wampanoag, Aki means land. It is something that we are grateful for. In one of our prayers, we say, Manat ka nikonahachik, creator and ancestor, thank you for the land. Katapatanamu wachiwami Aki. For me, all of Cape Cod has a connection to my ancestors. My folks have been here since this was under a mile of ice. When you get to set, and you feel the wind, and you feel the sun, it is very spiritual. You know that there's a bigger purpose than just for your enjoyment to look at it. What we put into the land, we get from the land. Our relationship is one of mutual respect. Yeah, land has its own DNA, and um, the humans have contributed to that for many thousands of years, and um, we know a bit about it. The mission of the Native Land Conservancy is to rescue land spaces that have some cultural significance, watersheds, and special areas where different species uh, need to be, almost like any other conservation group, but with an ancient connection to those spaces, I guess. Over the years, we've hosted walks with the Native Land Conservancy that really brought a new element of understanding how special our Native landscapes are. And as we moved forward, we wanted to figure out a more formal way to acknowledge their organization and also help us educate people on Native people's involvement with the land. 
The cultural respect agreement between the Dennis Conservation Trust and the Native Land Conservancy was signed December 19, 2016 at the Sturgis Memorial Library in Barnstable Village, Massachusetts. The agreement formally acknowledges that there is culturally important areas of the 250 acres behind Chapin Beach. The agreement allows the Native Land Conservancy access to educate its membership and allow for cultural observations to be practiced there. So it was really wonderful to also mesh tradition and ceremony with the signing of the compact. It was so moving and so powerful to me to be a part of that. This particular cultural respect agreement was very meaningful to me and nationwide. Uh, we're getting a lot of attention about it. It's our responsibility to work together with all of the people who live on Cape Cod. I hope for the future that other conservancies come to us and want to partner with us and want to have those stories told on their conservation land. This is the way, ideally, that people should function out of, you know, um, trust and respect. Because it does take a lot of trust to be able to share the land. Part of our partnership with the Native Land Conservancy includes a statement of respect. Please allow me to read just two paragraphs. Through this agreement, we wish to celebrate an open and sharing relationship with the Native Land Conservancy, one in which we support one another in our mission to create and care for open space, as well as learn together how to create an environment of respect. Respect for one another, respect for the land, respect for every living thing, plant or animal, that shares this land with us. For several hundred years, we have walked different paths. It is our intent through this agreement that we walk together to renew the spirit of the land. As to the future of the trust, we would say the vision of owning and protecting land may not be enough. We must, through education and outreach, through citizen science and partnerships, spread the word and ensure every citizen within our town understands the value of open space and the threat to every living thing if we don't ensure its protection. We can help provide the reasons, in some cases, the methodology and direction. However, individual buy-in and changes in how each of us treat the environment and show appreciation for all its life forms will be the proof that we are willing to take another path. In the words of John Hay, an environmentalist who lived just down the road in Brewster, a society interested in only in quick results has little time to spend on the rhythmic responses in a salt marsh or a wood that might be its salvation. And in the words of Catherine Hay and Francis Thompson, we were never above the land or superior to it any more than we are superior to the rest of nature. We are its dependents. Although the future is never as clear as the past, I do know this. We have a new partner in the Cape Museum of Art and the artist who represented our land. What you have created is powerful. It is a, cl a, a clear, excuse me, a powerful, it is as clear a message as can be sent about the beauty and importance of open space within the town. Thank you. Great. Well, we're going to do a little transition here. Um, <coughs> and Leslie Kramer's going to do something. I'll introduce you after we get this together. So just one minute, I'll make the transition. <laughs>
Well, thank you so much, Joe. That was really inspirational. Makes me proud to be working with the Dennis Conservation Land Trust to know all the good things that you're doing. So thank you for collaborating with us. Um, I'd like to introduce Leslie Kramer. She um, has participated in many aspects of the museum here, and she's currently one of the exhibitors with the printmakers of Cape Cod. Leslie has an MFA in printmaking from Rhode Island School of Design and studied printmaking for a year at Stanley Hayter's Atelier 17 in Paris. Her one-woman shows and group shows have been seen in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Mexico. Her prints are in the collections of the Cordova Museum, Lincoln Mass, uh, the Boston Public Library, in the Albuquerque Albuquerque, New Mexico Public Library, and numerous private collections. She has shown her work locally at the Cape Cod Museum of Art, PAM, the Katuit Center for the Arts, and the Cultural Center. She is the 2015 honoree of the Brewster Cultural Council, and for 26 years she taught printmaking and was the gallery director at Amira College in New York. She also has taught at Smith College and the Rhode Island School of Design. So please join me in welcoming Leslie Kramer. <laughs> type of collaboration because it makes so much sense uh, to join the artists and the conservation world. Um, I and so many of my fellow artists are very inspired by the landscape of Cape Cod and you, you see it in every exhibit um, of landscape, seascape, whatever abstraction, but yes, we're all very influenced by our beautiful environment and very attached to it, and we value it greatly. So I think this is a wonderful idea. Um, so my specific contribution and the group that I'm representing, which is Printmakers of Cape Cod, um, chooses the medium of printmaking to express our vision. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to talk today about what is an original print, um, some of the techniques that go into the process, some of the concepts behind the artworks, um, and you if you've seen the exhibit, you've noticed there's a wide range of expression. Um, again, which is typical of artists <laughs> who, you know, want to do their own thing. So, <clears throat> my talk, uh, just to introduce printmaking, um, is the concept of the original print. The term print has many meanings. Newspaper print, newsprint, uh, reproduction, original art, 
but printmaking is actually a very old art form and we could say that the first printmaker um, did a work of art in one of the cave paintings in France where the artist put their hand on the cave wall and then sprayed paint from um, blew the, the pigment around the hand and then removed your hand and so you get a negative hand and that's basically a stencil print so that goes back 20,000 years ago um, and printmaking as we know it today of course it has evolved greatly and it's very much evolving um, in the 21st century. Of course, I studied in the 20th century. <laughs> so, um, I've seen a lot of changes in printmaking just in my, in my lifetime. And uh, one of the things that printmakers are concerned about um, is toxicity of materials, um, which affect the environment and certainly affect the the artist who's working with those materials so <clears throat> we're evolving to towards more um, non-toxic substances water-based inks rather than oil-based um, solvents that are less toxic and um, that also, in a way, has expanded some of the possibilities of techniques that artists can use. So, I have, I have brought a number of examples, and I tried to bring things that you could see from a distance. <laughs> um, but you can also come down and look at things and touch things at the end of my talk. So I'm going to just spend um, a certain amount of time talking about some of the methods that we've been using. Um, and then we will look at some of the prints that are in the exhibit. So, okay, what is an original print? First of all, it's um, a work of art designed by the artist and possibly printed by the artist or it could be printed by a printer in a workshop that prints um, fine art. Um, so designed by the artist, printed, and it's not, today it is not always printed by hand, even digital art has come into the printmaking world. <clears throat> um, and signed by the artist. And uh, print could be a unique image, which is called a monotype or a monoprint, or it could be a multiple, such as uh, an etching or lithograph that is signed and numbered. So these are some of the categories that you might find uh, when looking at original artwork. So the first uh, technique that I'm going to talk about is intaglio, which comes, the term intaglio comes from the Italian word intagliere, which means to cut into. So, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a cross-section of a metal plate, and in intaglio, the artist cuts into the plate, either with acid or with a tool, such as a dry point needle or uh, a burin, and I have those here that you can look at. Um, then you apply ink to the surface, you push it into the deep areas, 
and you clean the surface. And um, here is a copper plate that I brought, one of my prints. So you can actually feel the depth of the line there. So there is, there's quite a bit of technique involved in printmaking, um, depending on the process used by the artist. So here is an example of one of the most direct forms of printmaking. And this is a dry point. Dry point is um, direct drawing on a metal or a plexiglass plate with a very sharp diamond point needle. And again, the artist rubs ink onto the surface. The ink goes into the lines, <clears throat> and then the surface is wiped clean. Um, okay, we'll and with this process, this is all done by hand. The only part that isn't is running through the press. And the press, you use dampened paper, the metal plate is underneath, and then when we remove the print, you see the image appearing. So, <clears throat> A very important thing to remember about printmaking, and here is the print. This is one of my, my things. Again, a nature topic um, is it's the mirror image of what is on the plate. So printmakers think in reverse. <laughs> We're very backwards. <laughs> and um, it you kind of learn to um, accommodate the reversal. But it's also a lot of the fun of printmaking because you never know exactly what it's going to look like until you take the print off the press. So it keeps it exciting um, and unexpected. Sometimes the unexpected <laughs> can be the best part of the work. So that also makes it exciting and fun. So under intaglio, cutting into the plate, we have etching and graving, <clears throat> which is done with a sharp tool called a burin, where you push through the metal. And a dry point, this example which I showed. And here, again, another tool, a very sharp tool to scratch in. Um, and you can create a lot of depth with hatching and cross hatching which are these dark areas. So there's so many possibilities. <clears throat> um, Collagraph, I don't think there are any collagraphs in the exhibit. Um, not that I remember. But that is just a collage technique where the artist creates the plate from cardboard and textures, and then uh, uses that as the matrix. The matrix is the surface or the plate, whether it's metal or wood, or a collage that you print from. So <clears throat> um, with printmaking, each each print is an original. It's a multiple original. So if you, if you have a matrix such as a copper plate, you can print multiple copies from this, but each is an original. And prints are, um, prints are 
priced lower than paintings, but generally, if you, there is an addition of prints, the total number might equal the cost of a painting. So they are a good buy because you're getting an original um, for maybe by the same artist, but it will probably be less expensive than a painting would be. Um, so if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them at the end of my talk. Okay. So relief printing is the just the opposite of intaglio. In relief printing, you're printing the surface of the plate. This is just a piece of linoleum, and this is a student work. Um, and it was more, for each color, more was cut away from the linoleum and then printed over the previous image. So what's left is just the tree branches, basically. I hope you can see that a little bit. Um, I think you probably can see this. So, and then ink is applied to the linoleum with a roller. Okay? And it's just on the surface. So, What's cut away remains white, and then each color successively uh, is cut away until only the trunk is left. And that was the final color, the dark green. So um, here, here is another student work, a linoleum print. And you can see, you notice the texture. The texture of the linoleum or the wood is visible. So that's one way to possibly determine a relief print. <clears throat> and um, the third main technique is planographic, which is totally flat, a flat surface. And the main method there is lithography. So lithography is, um, can look very much like a drawing. Um, and this was done, it can be done on um, a beautiful thick piece of Bavarian limestone or on a metal plate, which is a contemporary version of the limestone. <coughs> um, and so you create lines with a greasy crayon on the stone um, and then washes with a, a liquid greasy material called tush. Tush. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <clears throat> lithography is based on the principle that oil and water do not mix. So imagine uh, here is the stone. Before printing, you have a sponge and you have to wet the whole surface of the stone. And where you, you drew, actually drew this image right on the stone in a greasy crayon. So when you wet the stone, the water goes into the areas where there is no grease. Then you, you ink your roller and you roll it over. And if you've done it properly, <laughs> I'm simplifying this greatly, then the ink will pick up exactly where your original drawing was. So you can do an addition 
An edition is a group of prints that are as alike as possible. Uh, and generally, uh, people do multiples of lithographs. Now, <clears throat> one of our artists, um, Anne, Anne Giuliani, Anne isn't here, but she uses lithography in her monoprints. So people are sort of breaking down <coughs> borders between some of these techniques and combining them in new ways, which is exciting. And it keeps things fresh for us artists who've been doing this for a long time. There's always, there's always something new to try. Um, okay, the fourth main technique is silk screen, which I know you've all heard of. You think of Andy Warhol and his Campbell soup cans and his Marilyn Monroe's. Um, so silk screen is a stencil <coughs> method where you're working um, with a big frame that has silk stretched on it and you have ink that uh, you push through through the screen with the fabric. You block out those areas where you don't want the ink to print. So again, this is a student work. And the white area would have been blocked with a resist so that no ink could fall on the paper which sits under this, this screen. Um, and there's only one, two, three colors in this, but it makes a, a lovely image. And she's used the white of the paper very nicely in this. So this ha is also uh, just flat on the surface. You don't see any depth or embossing, which you would see in the intaglio and possibly in some of the relief prints. Okay. Then, <clears throat> now you also will see um, a lot of digital or some digital prints and photo processes combined with with things in the with maybe traditional techniques in the exhibit. So again, art is a reflection of the time in which it's created. Sorry. And of course everything has been influenced by by the digital age. So artists also um, incorporate digital work or may incorporate it or some aspect of it maybe in their sketching or in their planning or some, in some way it's often a part of uh, what we're doing today. So here is a digital print. Uh, this is by Ron Pocrasso, who's a well-known printmaker from uh, New Santa Fe, New Mexico. And he's taken images, uh, either that he's photographed himself, and combined them. And I really am not sure exactly what he did. And I sometimes I don't even know exactly what I do. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty frequent. Um, and he uh, print. Uh, transferred all these images, all these images onto a metal plate and then printed, uh, made this print, which I believe is a digital print. So all of that has kept printmaking um, very interesting. Then just another thing to think about is that many artists today, or 
I think always, have done things in series. And um, you won't just do one image. You might try different versions, different variations. And these are our two prints that I made when I was in Paris a long time ago. <laughs> and um, so I created this plate, um, which was a, a metal plate etched in acid. And then I had to figure out how I was going to print it. So <clears throat> usually what the artist will do is a number of different trial prints to see how you want it to look. So I, I chose this, this color combination because I wanted it to have a brighter um, and warmer look. But you can see how dark, how different a feel you would get from each one. So once the artist has created the matrix, in this case it was uh, a metal plate, then we have to decide how, how we want to print it and how we want to present it to the public. So I guess that's the end of my show and tell. <laughs> and Benton, could we look at some of the slides and we can move this out of the way? I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I got that. <laughs> and we do have time for some questions, if people have questions. And as I said, you can come and look at some of these close up also. I have not, I have not made my own inks, but uh, as I said, there are people creating non-toxic inks, which was definitely um, an improvement over some of the things that we've been using. And uh, I have actually used plants themselves to create prints by running leaves or flowers through the press, the pigment from the leaf or the flowers will transfer to the damp paper. And so I, I have printed actual plant materials, which is also very, very fun to do. So, yes. How hard is it to actually etch? Um, yeah, each, each technique is different. Um, it does take quite a bit of patience. And it's, it can be quite physical, especially if you're working large. I only really brought in small things. Um, and one, one print of mine in the show is quite long. And that was printed with a steamroller. <laughs> um, yeah, at Castle Hill in Truro. Uh, they rent a steamroller for a day for people who want to print large works. <laughs> so that was an adventure. And, um, yeah, they just had it outside and we used blankets and laid everything down with ink and they ran over it. So, <laughs> um, there's so many possibilities and that that's what makes it a lot of fun. The image of Anne Giuliani's is up. Oh. Is that Anne's? No. Oh. Joan Apple. Okay. This is Joan Apple, or Appel. I'm not sure how she pronounces it. She's not here. 
And so this is um, a very nice monotype. Now you see the terms monotype and monoprint. A monotype um, you can think of as a printed painting. So it's just painted on a surface like a plexiglass or a metal plate and then run through the press. So it's really a printed painting. Um, and it, it's different from the term monoprint, or people make the distinction. A monoprint has some traditional technique as a part of it. So that there are some sort of repeatable elements and others that are unrepeatable. Um, so, okay, this is the, all right, this is by Mary During, and now she has called this, um, Integrated Media Archival Print. Woo! <laughs> um, she uses... She developed an allergy, an allergy to the solvents and the inks from <coughs> traditional printmaking. And so she went to <coughs> more uh, digital or photographic methods to do her work that were non-toxic. Excuse me. <coughs> I brought some candy just in case. <laughs> <coughs> so she takes many images and <coughs> collages them together. This is by <coughs> Barbara Ford Doyle and this is also a monotype and this uses photo emulsion. So it combines photographic methods and then is printed by hand. Okay, next. Or are they just timed? No. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> All right. Oh, this is by Alice Nicholson Gaelic who's another past president of Printmakers of Cape Cod. And Alice does a lot of layering, and she does woodcut, monoprint, and photo, photo transfer, and chine collé. I didn't discuss chine collé. That's a, a method of collaging um, rice paper and printing on it simultaneously and you will see that technique. Um, the background of this, which is that blue with little specks, is a textured rice paper. So it's a way of adding color and texture to a print. Next. Next. This is by Anne Giuliani. And Anne calls this a litho monoprint. So she's combining <coughs> lithography and printmaking, which are some freehand elements, and probably the colors. <laughs> <coughs> and I think the litho part would be the kind of purplish line area. So <coughs> it creates a very free and watery looking landscape with her colors. Okay, this was 
my steamroller monoprint. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> while there, I printed the blue background, the water, and the fish on top of it with the steamroller. <laughs> and then I took it home and I thought it needs something more. So the rocks were part of another print that I had made previously and I collaged those into the image. Now one of my favorite I was inspired by Bound Brook Conservation Area. I live in West Brewster, which is very close to Dennis. And um, I love that spot. It's so beautiful there with the little herring run and um, the pond and the cemetery. It's just a lovely little spot. So I was excited that I could include this because I'm, I'm quite interested in the herring and the preservation of the herring runs. So, okay, here's the next one by Chippa Martin. And this contains dry point, woodcut, chincole, and gold leaf. So, of course, it's a lot smaller than that, <laughs> but you get to see the real thing upstairs. Again, it's kind of an impression. Okay, this one is by Andrea Moore. Um, and I think she really captured the look of the marsh with maybe a high tide or a mid tide um, and the houses on the edge of the marsh and <clears throat> giving you that feeling of depth uh, in the landscape. She did very nicely. So Let's see. This is also a mono print. She uses, I believe she uses stencils. There, that's better. Mm -hmm. It was too close. Okay, this is interesting. This is um, a white line print um, by Jerry Moriarty. And this is a small a small work, um, and the artist cuts cuts a linear image out of a small a block of wood, and then paints each color successively, and the the paper is taped to one end, and you do one color at a time. You lay the paper on and rub the back of it. So <clears throat> she would have rubbed each color individually, but it lets you create a very nice image uh, in multiple colors, and you don't need any special material or studio space. <clears throat> so that's a great technique. And that was invented um, in Provincetown, I believe. So the, this one is Liz. Liz is here. Liz Perry. Yeah. Liz Perry. Would you like to say anything, Liz? Uh, let's see. That's a uh, uh, Carl and I went down to uh, Chase Garden Creek and took photographs of the morning. Mm -hmm. There were willets flying all around us. Oh. They were so beautiful and they had to keep them dry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took a number of photos and I came home. There was this one little pine tree sitting there and the willets were flying all around it. So uh, I did a little dry plate etching with two plates. And I did a 
little close up of one of the willets flying right over the marsh that kind of scoop low and then come up high. And uh, so I printed that in two plates, take them up together, printed them together, and then uh, I added watercolor to them. So that's an artist group. I I did two of them. I might do some more, I don't know, but um, it's sort of experimental. <clears throat> right. A lot of us enjoy experimenting mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, coming up with new ways of doing things. That's sort of the American way, I think. Yeah. We love just trying anything we can, see what comes out. So it, it makes it very exciting. Thank you, Liz. Uh, this is a photo montage by Deborah Pressman. Um, and it was also inspired by Sisuit so Neck, uh, Marsh Grass. <clears throat> Although, unfortunately, she's showing the Phragmites, <laughs> which we all know is invasive. <laughs> um, but she did a, a nice artwork, um, sort of suggesting a lot of movement of the grasses. Okay. All right, this one. This is a collaboration, and that's another thing contemporary artists are doing, is collaborating frequently with two, you know, two people or more collaborating on a project. So Sarah Riley and Deb Mel <coughs> uh, created Spirit Guide of Waterways. And so I see some printmaking techniques in some of the spirals, the repeated forms, and um, they just described it as mixed media. So there is probably some painting and all different kinds of things included in this image, <coughs> which um, is quite interesting. Okay, Sarah Ringler, Swan River, cyanotype. Um, Oops, I didn't brush up on my cyanotype methods. <laughs> um, but you paint a, an emulsion, a photo emulsion, I guess on, on paper and then expose it to light and you get this uh, blue, blue tone so image. It kind of takes it beyond the photograph and including the border so you can kind of see it's framing a portion of the image. Um, okay, now here is a very nice traditional lino cut and it says Sheen Collé. Um, I'm not sure Maybe the color is a little bit off, but there is probably, might be a tone in the, in the ground, in the background. But again, you can see very clearly the, the cutting of the gouge in the linear elements, which gives it a very graphic quality. And <clears throat> black and white, is going to be the most dramatic sort of image because it's the most high contrast <clears throat> and is quite different from a color, full color image. Um, and that's just, you know, a very nice style of print that's, that is quite traditional. So our last one is a woodcut. And I chose this one so you could kind of almost see the grain of the wood down in the bottom area. <clears throat> in addition to the texture 
of the gouges that have cut into it. Um, the German Expressionist artist did a lot of woodblock printing because it's it's very expressive, it can be very expressive um, and sort of a very strong image. And so this is a depiction of, I assume, native people in the landscape. And that's the last slide. Well, I have so, a, a image of where the artists did their works. You okay. Can see. Uh, oh, right. And that's upstairs on a poster, so you can see that. Yes, later. where each inspiration came from, what areas. Right. Um, so, I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have them. Um, and I'll be glad to few questions already. Thank you. To accompany the exhibition, we'll be having a printmaking uh, workshop, and that will be at Joyce Horstis's studio in Orleans. Um, and the workshop is titled uh, New Horizons. It's a three-day workshop from December 3rd to the 5th, so if you're interested in trying some techniques yourself, you can sign up on our website for that. There's also, I should just let everybody know, the artwork in this exhibition is for sale. We already have sold six of the works that are up in the exhibition, which is great news because 25% of the proceeds will go to the Dennis Conservation Land Trust, 50% to the artist, and 25% to the museum. So I hope you uh, feel inspired and uh, to maybe purchase one of these works. So we'll keep the museum open for a little while so you can now just have a look at the, uh, the show in person. And then I hope you do come back again the show runs through December 12th. So thank you all for coming today, and thank you, Dennis Conservation Land Trust, and we're going to take a Cape Cod. Thank you.